Hi everyone, I'm Chris and welcome back to this machine learning course. In this section, we will consider the increasing variance across deep neural networks. In the previous section, we considered neurons in a row as a simple example for deep neural network. We learned about the influence of the weights and activation functions on the gradients. We focused on the selection of the activation function. In this section, we will take a look on the weight parameters. In contrast to the previous considerations, we will incorporate more neurons in the layers of the neural network. How can we ensure a stable and smooth training at the beginning of a gradient-based minimization from the perspective of the weight parameters? Of course, the weights are trainable parameters of the neural network. We can only specify them to our needs at initialization. This will help to start from the best point in parameter space. Neurons in the middle of a deep neural network take the outputs of preceding neurons as input. These inputs are scaled by multiplicative weights. Then the scaled inputs are aggregated. This summation, denoted by V, aggregates the capital L number of inputs. It seems probable that the variance in these inputs aggregate as well. So the summation has a larger variance than one of the inputs because multiple inputs come together. We will later prove that indeed the variance increases by the number of incoming neurons. This increased variance is then transferred to the next layer. Again, many neurons with an increased variance are aggregated, so the variance further increases. The corresponding distributions of the outputs of a neuron is sketched by the green curves. It widens across the layers of the neural network. The variance of the neuron's output increases from the input towards the neural network's output. At initialization, the output values from the neurons of a specific layer are distributed according to a certain distribution function. For example, a standard normal distribution with mean 0 and variance 1 for the weights could be used. As illustrated, we examine how this choice influences the variance of the distribution of the output values of the neuron layers. We will calculate how the variance of the output increases from layer to layer if a standard normal distribution is used for weight initialization. Why would such an increase in the layer output's variance bother us? The output of the neural network itself needs to fit the data. Typically, input and target values of the data are normalized. The gradient-based minimization adjusts the weight parameters to fit the data. The neural network's output is the output of the final layer, Y1. This output depends on the aggregated outputs of neurons in the preceding layer, Y2. If the variance of the outputs of the neurons increases toward the neural network's output, this leads to large values for Y2. So the gradient-based minimization first needs to decrease the corresponding weight parameters to compensate this and rescale the neural network's output. This is because the output needs to fit the target variable values. The question is, can we do a proper weight initialization which takes the effect of increasing variance into account before starting the gradient-based minimization? This will lead to faster convergence because we start at a more appropriate point in parameter space. We consider a neuron in the middle of a deep neural network. Exemplarily, this is in layer number 3. We will calculate how the variance of the output values of this layer is related to the variance of the outputs of the preceding layer, layer number 4. 
So how does the variance of the outputs change across a neuron layer? We will prove that the variance in layer 3 is equal to the number of incoming neurons capital L times the variance of these inputs at time of initialization. Thereby, we will assume that the weights are distributed according to a standard normal distribution. At first, for simplification, we assume a linearized activation function. For example, for the sigmoid activation, this assumption holds in the transition region from 0 to 1 as sketched on the lower right side. Then, the output of the cased neuron in layer 3, yk superscript 3, is equal to the summation zk superscript 3 of the neuron. This summation is given by a bias term, here denoted by w0, and the linear combination of the inputs of this neuron with the weights. The inputs are the capital L outputs YL superscript 4 from layer number 4. Next, we will prove the following relation for the output of the L neuron of layer number 4, which is YL superscript 4, and its corresponding weight WL. The variance of the weight times the output is equal to the squared of the weight's expectation value times the variance of the output plus the squared expectation value of the output times the variance of the weight plus the variance of the weight times the variance of the output. So we need to know the basics of expectation value and variance. We will not go into the rigorous mathematical details of stochastic here. Instead, we will use a common analogy to understand the terms. Imagine we have capital N values xi randomly selected according to a certain distribution function. We calculate the mean of these values by adding them together and dividing the result by the number of values capital N. However, if we pick a different set of numbers xi, we might get a slightly different mean. Loosely said, the expectation value gives a correct mean value. So if you take infinite number of sample values or consider a lot of different mean values, this is the expectation value. The values xi are sample values according to a distribution function. So the stochastic variable x represents the corresponding variable together with the distribution. For our neural network, the weight parameter and the output, as well as the summation variables, are stochastic variables as well for the initialization. Because of the analogy between mean and expectation value, both share similar calculation rules. For example, a constant factor in a summation can be factored out and put in front the sum. The same is true for an expectation value. We can put a constant factor in front. Two of such stochastic variables, x and y, are called statistically independent if they don't affect each other. That means, if we pick simultaneously samples of x and y, the selected sample of x does not affect the selection of a sample of y. As a consequence, if we calculate the expectation value of x times y, it is equal to the expectation value of x times the expectation value of y. This is because there is no statistical connection between these variables. With the analogy of the summation, it is like x and y have different summation indices. The variance can be regarded as average variation level around the mean value. The variance is defined as expectation value of the squared difference of x and expectation value of x. We can rewrite this expression by multiplying this out. 
Then we have the expectation value of x squared minus 2 times x times the expectation value of x plus the squared expectation value of x. Because of the analogy between expectation value and mean, we can split the expectation value of this sum into three separate parts. This gives the expectation value of x squared minus the expectation value of 2 times x times the expectation value of x plus the expectation value of the squared expectation value of x. In the term in the middle, we can factor out the 2 and the expectation value of x. Both are constant factors. And according to our analogy of expectation value and mean, we can apply the calculation rules of a summation. The third term, the expectation value of an expectation value, is just the expectation value. This is similar to the mean value of a mean. So a mean value is a constant, but its mean is this constant. Now we see that we can reduce the latter two terms to minus the squared expectation value of x. This gives our expression for the variance of x. The expectation value of x squared minus the squared expectation value of x. Next, we can prove the relation on top of the page. To simplify the notation, we set the weight WL as x and the input yl superscript 4 as y. As shown, the variance of a variable can be expressed as the expectation value of the squared variable minus the squared expectation value of the variable. The way wl is initialized according to a distribution function. The output of the previous layer yl superscript 4 is independent of these weights at initialization time. The weight affects only the subsequent output yl superscript 3 of the layer it belongs to. Consequently, wl and yl superscript 4 can assume to be statistically independent at initialization. For statistically independent variables, we can split the multiplications within the expectation value. So we have the expectation value of squared x times the expectation value of squared y minus the squared expectation value of x times the squared expectation value of y. The variance of x is equal to the expectation value of x squared minus the squared expectation value of x. The latter term can be put on the left side. So the expectation value of x squared is equal to the variance of x plus the squared expectation value of x. This is substituted for the expectation value of x squared in our relation. Similarly, the expectation value of y squared is replaced. This leads to the first two factors, the squared expectation value of x plus the variance of x and the second factor, the squared expectation value of y plus the variance of y. Further, we still have the term minus squared expectation value of x times squared expectation value of y. We can multiply this out. This gives the squared expectation value of x times the squared expectation value of y plus the squared expectation value of y times the variance of x plus the variance of y times the squared expectation value of x plus the variance of x times the variance of y minus the squared expectation value of x times the squared expectation value of y. The first summand cancels out with the last one. This leads to the relation we are looking for. If we translate x to wl 
and y to yl superscript 4, we have proven our formula of the variance of wl times yl superscript 4. A typical initialization of the weights is to use a standard normal distribution with mean 0 and variance 1 for all layers. So the expectation value of wl is equal to 0 and the variance of wl is equal to 1. However, at this point we will not decide to choose a variance of 1 yet. To simplify the calculations, we assume centered outputs. This means the expectation value of yl superscript 4 is equal to 0. Note that you could use a different arbitrary constant instead. This will lead to an additional term, but the calculations are pretty similar. If we use all the assumptions, our variance equation simplifies dramatically. The first term vanishes because the expectation value of wl equals 0. The second term vanishes because of the centered inputs. Because we keep the variance of the weights as variable, we have the variance of wl times yl superscript 4 is equal to the variance of wl times the variance of yl superscript 4. Because we assumed linear activation functions, the output of the neuron in layer 3, yk superscript 3, is a linear summation without any nonlinear activation. So yk superscript 3 is equal to w1 times y1 superscript 4 plus and so on plus w capital L times y capital L superscript 4. Note that for simplification we neglected the bias term here. This is a valid assumption when a lot of incoming neurons are considered. Then we can take the variance on both sides. We assume that each WL times YL superscript 4 summand is independent identically distributed. This assumption seems valid at initialization. The weights obey all the same assumed standard normal distribution, or at least a distribution with mean 0 and a fixed variance. And the neural network itself is highly symmetric. There is at initialization time no preference for any of the outputs in the layer. So the variance of the sum of w1 times y1 superscript 4 plus and so on plus w capital L times y capital L superscript 4 reduces to capital L times the variance of WL times YL superscript 4, where WL times YL superscript 4 is an arbitrary term L of the sum. This leads to our final result. The variance of the output in layer 3 equals capital L times the variance of the weights times the variance of the neurons output in the preceding layer 4. So if you take the variance of the weights equal to 1, the equation reduces to capital L times the variance of YL superscript 4. Now, the idea is to compensate the increasing variance at initialization by using a different weight initialization than the standard normal distribution. The Chabier initialization takes the number of incoming neurons into account. The variance of the distribution function for weight WL is 1 over capital L. Capital L is the number of neurons of the preceding layer. When you take a look on the equation on the upper left, you will see that the capital L cancels with the variance of WL for this choice. So this compensates the change in variance. 
Consequently, the variance of the outputs of the neurons is approximately the same for all layers. The gradient minimization starts at a more appropriate point in parameter space. Section finished. Thank you very much for listening. If you like this video, please click the like button and consider to subscribe this channel. If you have any questions or comments, please leave a comment down below. So thanks again and see you in the next section.